Hi everyone, welcome to Ice Faces 2 Essentials. Well, this is going to give you an overview of everything that's important with Ice Faces 2.0, which is the current version of Ice Faces. So how many people have used Java Server Faces? Yeah, I ex expected so. Well, Ice Faces is an extension to Java Server Faces. Java Server Faces is the modern web standard. So we started off with struts, and all the best ideas from a variety of web frameworks have been incorporated to give us a modern MVC framework, which is GSF. Some of the key characteristics are the server-side component tree, declarative views, uses Java beans very nicely with expression language binding them together. There's navigation rules to move from one view to the next. Some of those are fairly simplistic within JSF itself and is supported by all major development tools and servers. Of course, you can take the JSF jar files and use it to deploy to any server that you want. Now, what's the basic philosophy of ice faces? I'd like to express it on this slide. With ice faces, we want Ajax to be transparent. We want you to be able to focus on your application, not on doing low-level things like wiring up components in the page or doing JavaScript, none of that. We want you to, to take what is really strong in JSF, which is the clean separation between the model and the view. Your model, of course, is a Java bean, a POJO, hopefully, since it's preferable not to have to import a variety of custom types in, into your bean. And then in your page, in your page, you should just be worried about the layout of the components. You shouldn't have to put in any meta information about when I click on this, this should update. Um, I should have this JavaScript snippet. With IceFaces, our, our idea is that you work with the components in a purely declarative fashion. And that allows developers and designers to preserve their roles. And of course, sometimes the developer and the designer are the same person. Preserving the role then means that you can really focus on the task that you're doing at that time and be very productive. So that's, that's our philosophy. Now, just to mention, the, the way that IceFaces works as a project there's the Ice Faces open source project, and then there's a commercially supported version called the Ice Faces Enterprise Edition. The 2.0 version just came out in April. The difference, say, between the open source version and the enterprise version, in some ways, is the certification, where the Enterprise Edition goes through an extra round of testing on some of the commercial application servers that are a little more, um, a little less pleasant to work with than, say, Tomcat, we certify it on those servers and fix any last minute remaining bugs on those. And then we also support all of the browsers for the open source version, including Internet Explorer 6. So testing on Internet Explorer 6 is not the most straightforward thing. It doesn't respond to automation as well as some of the more modern browsers, but it's very important in a lot of environments to have Internet Explorer 6 support. So for the Enterprise Edition, before the Enterprise Edition goes out, it is completely tested, in some cases by hand, on, on Internet Explorer 6, and certified to work there. So we do require Servlet 2.5. We have the author of the Portlet Faces Bridge right here in the audience. That's how we, we support portlets. Enterprise Edition includes the Enterprise Push Server. And then if you're still on the 1.8 train, well, we just released the patch 3 for Ice Faces 1.8, and you can, you can download that. Now let's take a look at an Ice Faces 2 sample application. This is WebMC. Let's look at the demo first. And WebMC is a slide sharing system. We can choose a slide presentation and join. We're illustrating a few things here. Illustrating the Ice Faces components, which are used to build this application. You can see that the slides are updating, in this case on autopilot, because there's no, there's no moderator controlling it. It's just on a timer. But still, that's using Ice Faces Ajax push to update it, as well with the chat portion. If there was another user here, the chat would be pushed to all of the users. So you, you can see that there are kind of two mainly interesting interactive components. And that's the, the slide portion and the chat portion. Well, how do you develop those? 
Actually, before I asked who's used GSF, who here is currently using Ice Faces? OK, so that's good. This will be a valuable introduction to Ice Faces. As I mentioned, there are, there are two key areas. The overall, WebMC, this is, this is a facelet in Ice Faces 2.0. And you can see that it's entirely declarative, even though it was a highly interactive page. The way that the slides are displayed, it's simply a graphic image where the current URL is the slide URL. The push aspect is driven from the server, from the Java code. I'll, I'll illustrate that later. But you can see that there's nothing you have to worry about in the page in order to have push in your application. That's because when IceFaces renders, it renders into a DOM on the server, detects the changes to that DOM, and sends just the changes to the browser. That's why with IceFaces, you don't have to wire up Ajax yourself. There's no re-rendering that you need to worry about, as with some other frameworks, or such as with GSF 2.0, built-in Ajax capability. IceFaces does, at runtime, what you might be forced with other frameworks to do during development time. And of course, if you do it at development time, when your application changes, you may be re-rendering the wrong part of the page depending on changes in the backing beans or other changes in the page. So we find um, IceFaces users are much more productive in, in, this, in this way because they're not doing what are effectively low-level optimizations during early stages of development. Now we also illustrate some of the facelet capabilities, such as including a chat page in this main page, besides the, the slide image. That's this part. How do you implement chat? Well, chat is built up of a data table where it basically has one column. Here we have the, the sender name of a message and then the actual message. So again, you see that there's no Ajax concerns in the page, even though it's all dynamically updated via push. Because of the IceFaces rendering process, we just have to place the components on the page where we want them and bind them to the model through expression language such as here with the, the beam. To create that dynamically updating slide, all we do is return the current slide URL. The moderator changes the value of that URL. When the page is rendered, that change in the URL is rendered into the document object model on the server. IceFaces detects the change to that URL and will send just that URL down to the browser. So you can see that it, it, it's very easy to develop. Now, let me point out some other new things in here in GSF 2. Now, how many people are using GSF 2.0? OK, so we're just kind of getting into that. You can see some annotations here that will be new compared to GSF 1.2. We can say that this is a managed bean. In this case, we don't need to give its name because the, the name could be picked up from the class name. But this particular bean is view scoped. What that means is that the, the bean is stored with the component tree. We'll talk about view scope a little bit later. It, it has, it's a nice scope, but it's not the silver bullet that I was hoping it would be. Now, since you, if you haven't worked with Ice Faces before, this will be new. This is the Ajax push portion. And it, as you can see, it is extremely easy to add the push features. That's the slides being updated from the server or under moderator control for all users. It's extremely easy to add this feature to your IceFaces application. You just need about three lines of code. Now imagine that we have multiple presentations on that same server. You can see that we had one mobile presentation, one a slideshow of somebody's travel photos. Each of these different groups of users will have slides that will advance differently because there will be a different moderator for each of those presentations. So each of those presentations is a group. Well, the natural name for that group is the name of the presentation, perhaps processed in some way so that it, it's a legitimate Java string. So for every viewer that is in a, a particular group, we simply add the current session to that presentation name, group. So that means that when the moderator advances the slide and evokes render, all of the users in that group under that presentation will have their GSF pages rendered on the server, and the changes will be pushed out to the browser. So you didn't have to worry about what was changed on the page. With IceFaces, you just say, something interesting has happened in the application. I want you to push this out to all of those users in that group. 
we say add current session because that user might have multiple browser windows open. There are lower level APIs, such as add current view, that you can use in Ice Faces if you don't want to render all of the browser windows that a user has open. But that means that now in your application, you have to pay attention to which browser windows are associated with which events. And really, users don't have that many windows open. The performance benefits are probably less significant than your productivity benefit for not worrying about which windows they have open. It's easier to be concerned with just which users you have in the system. Now, you'll see an interesting difference here compared to Ice Faces 1.8, where the push render is rendering the group, but we're also passing in this push notification, where the, the push notification is used for the cloud push feature to mobile devices. I'll have to, I'll have to show you that in order to explain it. And I'll talk about that further in the ice push section. So now, I've been talking about, well, what, what if you had ice faces 1.8, moving to ice faces 2.0? Here are the sorts of things that you'll, you'll want to keep in mind. One is to skip the comments in your facelets. If, if you've been using ice faces 1.8, facelets is, is already configured to ignore any kind of comments. And so that means that Suddenly, switching to 2.0, if you don't skip them, you'll have comments in your output markup in your page, and that under certain conditions within data tables and other sort of unusual edge cases, it'll be disruptive and it will be difficult to debug. So if, if you're currently working with, by porting an application, I would simply set this and, and skip the comments. It's fairly unusual to actually want comments to be embedded in your HTML output. One of the reasons is maybe you're using a tool chain that inserts comments so that it can track which parts of the page are modified, but that's, that's probably not the case. Another simplification is if you're using Ice Faces 1.2, sometimes to make Ice Faces pages and non-Ice Faces pages, you made use of what we called the Just Ice jar, which did not automatically convert components into Ajax versions of, them, of themselves. Well now, you can add the ice core config render equals true on the ice faces pages. What this means to ice faces is that if render is set to true, that means that ice faces will render that page. And even if you use an h colon command button, it will automatically become an Ajax command button. Well, that's, that's how that feature works. You don't need the old servlet mappings from ice faces 1.8 except for there are a couple of compat components such as output chart that still require the, the compat resource servlet. We're working on removing those, but they were, um, it was just not, not, not uh, to be done at this time. Now, the faces config, if you're using Ice Faces 1.8, you're using GSF 1.2, the new faces configs in web.xml, such as for servlet 3.0, are schema based. You should update those. You'll use push renderer rather than session renderer. The API is essentially identical. That's an easy port. If you're using the render manager, that's not available and in Ice Faces 2.0. But hopefully you were using the session renderer, which was much easier to use than the render manager. Now the disposable bean interface is effectively replaced with pre-destroy. And there's an additional lifecycle method that here as well, post-construct. So these are standard servlet 2.5 annotation lifecycle methods that w when, when you have a bean, after all the other beans around it in the same scope have been constructed, and the post-construct will be called. So that's a really good time to do initialization. Or m much better than finalize, which is a very kind of risky thing to depend on, pre-destroy will be called on the bean when it goes out of scope. So that's just like the disposable bean. And these are standard servlet annotations. We recommend that you use those. Now, well, view scope versus extended request scope. I think there are some very kind of minor aspects where you might miss extended request scope. The worst thing about it, of course, was that we modified the behavior of request scope because it, in GSF 1.2, it was not possible to add your own scopes. View scope is attached to the lifetime of the view the unfortunate thing in GSF 2.0 is sometimes the lifetime of the view is not obvious, as, as you might think. I have a particular slide on that, so we'll get to that. Now, another 
uh, porting tip is partial submit was an attribute on a lot of ice faces components. Now we have a single submit. It's a tag. It's actually a facelift handler that allows you to augment even an, a standard H colon component with what is effectively partial submit, very similar. What it does is it means that when you interact with that component, just that component will be submitted. This is different from the partial submit behavior where all of the components in the form would be submitted, but the ones not participating in that particular user event would be marked as not required. So where it's different is where, let's say you were counting on setters being called for a variety of different fields in that form, maybe to do some sort of cross-field validation. In most cases, single submit and partial submit, you won't notice the difference in behavior. The nice thing about single submit is that it can potentially scale a lot better because the entire form is not being submitted. We're only submitting one element that did the actual user event. So I keep coming back to this view scope. What is, is view scope the silver bullet? Well, it is a very strong scope, but it has still has some quirks. For instance, if you navigate through a navigation rule back to the same view, the view scope will be cleared. Some people like this behavior. They say, I'm using this. I, I navigate back to the view to clear the fields. I'm like, OK, well, there's no other way to do that. But in other cases, the navigation just takes you back to the same view. And you say, oh, I'm still on the same view. What happened to all my data? So this is kind of an unfortunate. It, it, uh, I would say that view scope should not be overloading this clear the fields behavior. Now, another aspect of view scope is that that view sti is still alive. You close the browser window, but the view scope is still there, taking up memory on your server. So maybe that's not what you want. And then finally, this is more of a problem for us uh, implementing ice faces, is that we, we can't get at things in the view scope until after the component tree is actually stored, because the view scope is stored inside the component tree. This is important for things, say, like file upload, where you're uploading files, and you want to process those file parts and send them back into the application somewhere, but you're doing this in a filter. So you don't have access to the component tree. Well, then there's nowhere for those file parts to go. We have to store them and keep, keep them around. It makes it awkward to implement that. Well, to address some of these concerns with view scope, we've added two annotations in IceFaces 2. One is view retained. If you put this view retained annotation on a view scope bean, that object will be propagated from that view to the next, which is the same view, it'll be propagated. So it won't be cleared when you navigate back to the same view. This allows you to use the view clearing behavior plus have certain objects propagated if you want in that case. The other is this window disposed annotation where if the window is closed, a message will be sent back to the server and any objects in view scope with that annotation will be actually removed. So you can use this to clean up on the server. Maybe you have a high server load. And when users close windows, you want those objects to go away, or there may be other reasons. You can do that. Now, the one drawback to it is that network communication that's required. No, normally, the browser does not send a message when the window is closed. In this case, it's necessary. Now, this window disposed is based on a window scope that we also provide in IceFaces 2. The window scope you can declare on your bean. What that means is that those objects will be available as long as you're interacting within that same window. So this is a, a simpler thing to work with than conversations that you might get in, say, something like CDI or, or Spring Webflow. But it's, um, it's available directly within IceFaces. Now, what, what's new? The jars have been rearranged slightly. IceFaces jar is still there. It's still the core jar. The compat jar now contains the components from IceFaces 1.8, as well as a bit of infrastructure that they need. There are some new components in the ACE jar. And now Ice Push has been split out completely into a standalone feature as Ice Push jar. You can add it or not add it to your IceFaces project, and um, it will be used at runtime if, if it's available. Of course, you can also use Ice Push with other technologies like GSP or GWT. We've worked hard on backwards compatibility, but if there are some APIs that you think are missing that you want in IceFaces 2.0 that you're using in IceFaces 1.8, just let us know.
Now, for instance, here are the components that we've brought forward. These are the 1.8 components. You'll find them in the compat jar. For developing new components, we've added a component generator. This is based on a Java syntax using annotations rather than some other component generators that are based on XML. You can say, I have a component. Here's the tag name. Here's its class. Here's all the meta information. And then you say, well, it has a property. Here's its default value. Give it the tag library documentation. There's method expressions. It's a, a nice way to build your components. Then the, this uh, generator runs during compile time, produces the actual component class. You still have to implement the renderer. But it can save you generating all of these other artifacts, such as the facelet files and the TLDs and, and all of that. And then it's implemented in Java, so it's type safe rather than XML. Now, the nice feature that we provide for developing your own components is sprites. So the sprite technique is based on reducing the size of images that you, you send down to the browser. So typically, maybe you have some sort of a calendar interface, and it, has, it looks like it has four little images. Well, you don't really want to make four HTTP requests for each calendar to fetch. Those, those are very small images. I mean, they're, of course, they're big. They're actually really small in the browser. Um, why not pack them all into a single image, fetch that with one HTTP request, and then position and mask it with CSS so that it's efficiently rendered by the browser and efficiently fetched? Well, we provide a framework based on smart sprites that lets you easily work with sprites in your components. And you can use those. And then then the, the sprites are served through the GSF2 resource mechanism. As well, there's the new ACE components that I mentioned. These are really focused on accessibility and proper tab key navigation type features. They have consistent skinning, and they use the sprite generation that, that you've seen. What are some of the ACE components? The animation one is uh, animation, so it, does, it has no standalone visual appearance. There's a new tab set, which has a variety of client-side, server-side modes, orientation. There's a tab set proxy. It's always difficult when you use a tab control, because often you want the, the tabs along the top, and then you want a form in one of the tabs. Well, you're already messed up, because you put a form around the outside so that the user could click on the tabs, but now you can't put a form inside one of the, one of the actual tabs. Well, the tab set proxy lets you target the actual interactive part of the tabs along the top into its own separate form. So you can split that out, and then you can put tabs in within the form. Sorry, you can put forms within the tab panels using that. Then there's a slider, a variety of buttons that have different behaviors, that some of the buttons that look like links, links that look like <coughs> buttons, checkbox button, a new file upload component. This file upload component has a, a nice feature that it actually submits the containing form along with it. So previously in IcePace's 1.8, the, the file upload was a hidden iframe, not a hidden iframe, it was an iframe. And when you would upload the file, you would just upload that one file. That meant it was detached from the rest of the JSF lifecycle because you were just submitting that iframe. Vice faces two, file upload actually takes place containing the whole form, and then the AJAX updates are obtained through, and that's where the hidden iframe is. So it's a more natural fit for the JSF lifecycle. And then there's a date as well as time picker. Well, how does this work under the hood? This is just a, a simple slide to tell you some of, the, some of the techniques in case you're curious about how IceFaces is built, where the integration points are. Well, like IceFaces 1.8, there's a DOM response writer. I mentioned this. The way that JSF renders, it normally just renders to a stream. Well, IceFaces renders into a document object model on the server. That gives us a structured form to the output. So when, it, when the page is rendered the first time, it renders a DOM, and we save that DOM. Then when the page is rendered a second time, it renders into a DOM, and now we have these two structures that we can compare and just send the differences. That gives you the automatic AJAX features of ice faces. Well, the DOM partial view context is where you hook into JSF2, actually a partial view context, in order to do AJAX processing. That's where you decide whether you do 
subtree evaluation or full page evaluation. Then there's resource handling in order to serve various scripts and images. On the client side, most of the Ajax plumbing is handled by JSF.js. JSF 2.0 was developed by all the major component vendors, um, Ice Faces, Rich Faces, ADF Faces. And we agreed on a common way to take an event from the browser, serialize it as a form, process it on the server, and then send back instructions. These instructions contain you know, update, insert, delete various nodes. And that Ajax payload is used to update the page. That's all standardized. What is specific to the component library is how it arrives at those Ajax updates. On the client side, IceFaces simply uses the JSF.js update, but then say for push and uh, other compat and component capabilities, we do have a, a, a rich JavaScript file. Now let's talk about Ajax push. We're going to do a, a mobile demo. How does Ajax push work? Well, in the case of a moderator, before we saw WebMC working, we had an automatically driven slideshow. Well, normally there would be a moderator and he'd be talking away and then he'd go to the next slide. So that's sent to the server. Now we need to push that to the other browsers. But there's an interesting wrinkle in this for the, the case of mobile users. Most of the time, the mobile user will be actually in the application and he'll get the push updates the same using the ice push blocking HTTP request like the desktop user would. But in other cases, maybe that mobile user has left the application or he's temporarily offline. There, we use the cloud push mechanism that's specific to the device, such as uh, Android Cloud Device Messaging or Apple Push Notification. Let's see a demo of that. Start these up. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show two demos here. One is first just the, the basic push capability without the cloud push. Here's a photo share application. It's a mobile application. The server is running here on the laptop. What we've done is we've created a native container that you install on the mobile devices. And the native container basically has a browser based on the standard WebKit browser that comes with all the modern mobile devices and phones. But we've added a few JavaScript APIs, just a few that give us access to the camera, microphone, as well as some push capabilities. So with the camera, I click on it. It made a JavaScript call. And now I have the, the device camera here. I can take a picture of the camera. So see, it looks like the Android device is offline. There it is. OK, so here's a picture that I took. I can use it. It's now encoded into the page and represented as a thumbnail. You can, you can sort of see it there. But if I send the message, you can see that it's pushed to the Android device as well. So we, we have ice push together with the device integration capabilities. Now let's, let's look at the, the push features for cloud push. Oops. Here are the mobility tests. There's a cloud push. We're going to combine this with the desktop demo. And you can see that it was updated for the desktop user as well through push. the windows, same application running on mobile and desktop. Now using regular ice push, you can see I sent that message. But what if the connection was paused and the user was out of the application? 
then I could send them a message. Now, the difference between these two buttons, actually, is one is sending with a push notification. That's the one on the bottom. And the top one is sending without the push notification. If I go send, the user's not in the application. So Ice Push switches over to use Apple Push Notification Service to send that notification to the device. And the user goes, oh, I have, it may cause it to vibrate or make a sound. And then they can view the application. And they will see the push update. So this, this is integrated with um, the Google phone as well. But I didn't demonstrate it at that moment. So that's, that's the new feature in IceFaces Mobile. How do you get that? Well, that's um, provided when you, when you render. But rather than using render with just the group name, you render using the push notification. Now this slide il illustrates another case that you might find of interest. Sometimes you need to invoke a push, but not from a GSF thread. For instance, you may have a JMS message coming in, and that JMS message should result in a push to all of your users. Well, that means that the push renderer doesn't have as much context as it might normally have in order to, to actually find itself in the system and in invoke that render. So what you do before the JMS message arrives is you capture a portable renderer from the push renderer. That's just an object that you can pass around within your application and invoke. So now we have this renderer. We can invoke render on it in the normal ice push fashion. So that's, that's what you would use, say, when you got an on message call back from GMS. As I mentioned, you can use ice push with other technologies, not necessarily with ice faces. It's, it's split out. We have integrations for Grails, JSP, Spring, Wicket, GWT, and uh, examples for pure JavaScript, such as jQuery. IcePush is notification-based, not message-based. What that means is that IcePush Ice is not sending data when it sends a notification. All that it does is it sends a notification. So that means that you don't have to worry about the security of exposing data when you add IcePush to an existing application. It will use the current data transport that you're using. So this makes sense, because you've, you've already built your AJAX application. It already has a data transport mechanism built into it, because as the user is clicking on things, you're sending events, and you're getting responses back from the server. All that you have to do is hook in Ice Push into that user event trigger mechanism, use that same data transport, and get your updates, rather than adding in another messaging system that sends data into the page, which is actually a completely different messaging system than your application had already. So Ice Push is, is simple to develop with. You get a push context. This, the, now, Ice Push is not based on GSF. So th these are, are some of the things that the Ice Push GSF features are doing underneath. But it can get at this information from GSF. So you'll need a servlet context. You can create a push ID. You still work with groups. And then you just push to those groups, and it will notify all of them in the group. For GSP, we provide some convenient things. Now, now this ice push region, that looks a lot like the low-level AJAX mechanisms that are provided um, in some of the other GSF frameworks, such as the built-in GSF 2.0 AJAX. Well, with GSP, that's the best you can do. You can just provide a low-level update region-based AJAX mechanism. I ice faces being built on top of GSF is able to give you better abstraction than that. Now, if you want the callback in the page, ice push, here's your JavaScript code. You just register a callback function, and that callback function will be called when the notification occurs. What you actually do in that callback function is up to you. Now, as I said, there's no way to pass data, but you can have multiple push IDs. So if you do need to separate out some different functions, just create multiple push IDs, and then obtain your data using your normal mechanism. So let's, let's turn now to some of the interesting new things that work well from GSF2 that you should be using with IceFaces2. Facelets, of course. GSP is essentially dep deprecated, and now uh, everybody's using the facelets with, with GSF. It's much more powerful, a much more object-oriented way to build a GSF application. I actually think that GSP has its place 
If you want to develop a JSP application, you should do so. It's highly scalable. Um, it's uh, when, when used in a disciplined manner, JSP can be very effective. If you're developing a JSF application, though, you should be using facelets, because facelets is the right level of abstraction for JSF. I would not use JSP. So what are, what are some of the differences? Well, one of the main difference is we can build composite components because of the way that the object-oriented fashion, the way that facelets works through templating. So composite components are good, but why? It's just a component. But what was so wrong with building a component yourself before? Well, look at all the stuff you had to create in order to do a component in TSF 1.2. You had to create your component class and your renderer class, and then a tag. Maybe if you're doing facelet, tag handler. Then you had to add these things in various configuration files, such as into the faces config. And then finally, with your tag, you had to go into the taglib.xml. So I think this really discouraged people from developing components themselves in, in GSF 1.2. Well, in GSF 2.0, of course, you can still do all that if you want. But you can actually now develop a composite component in just one file. So that, this is a big benefit over GSF 1.2. And as you'll see, developing composite components in iSpace is particularly simple because of the way that AJAX works. Well, to use a composite component, this, this is from a slide I gave at Java 1. And Neil wrote the original example. But sorry, I'm going to pick on your component a little bit because you used the F colon AJAX mechanism in it, and it, it made it kind of tricky. Vice faces, it's easy to develop that same component. Well, how do, how do we use it? Well, we say, here's my custom namespace, Java 1, under composite. I'll call my component color. It's a color picker, and it has a value. This is what I'd like to do. I'd just like to say, well, here's the color picker. Here's my output text telling me the value of the red color that they picked. With ice faces, that's all you need. But in order to give it AJAX capabilities without ice faces, we have difficulty rendering, re-rendering something that has changed based on where the user has clicked. So this is a, a good idea. We, we say, well, how about we say that this component will render any of its children when I do something with it? Now, that's, that's fine for simple cases. I think it would be difficult to have these composite components where they all were nested in order to pass around the update region IDs. But this is, a, this is an interesting technique. All right, well, how do we develop this component? We develop it in the composite namespace. Here's, here's what's new in JSF2. In facelets, you actually facelets um, with JSF 1.2, you could create what were effectively components. But you couldn't do things like this. You couldn't say it had an interface where there's names and values that get passed in. So this, this really makes it a first class component rather than just um, an included page fragment. To implement it, what would I like to do? I'm, I may not go through all of this in detail. But this has an input text. We have validation. We can extract values and set them into variables. So this really cleans up the, the composite component code. And you see, I'm just focusing on red here. There's actually more code that you would have for a legitimate color picker, where there's, I think there's other colors too. Um, I don't know, blue, maybe. Um, we have our command link. Well, th this, is the, this is all that you need in order to implement this composite component for ice faces, because ice faces will automatically update any parts of the page that have changed. You don't have to worry about calling that render yourself. So if you click on the color picker and you want Ajax to be used without ice faces, you have to take that trick where we're going to say by that convention that we're going to render the children of the component. But then you have a lot more work in order to manually add Ajax into this component. What this means is that if you're developing a composite component and you want it to support Ajax, if you're not using ice faces, you've got quite a bit more work to do, and this is a fairly complicated thing to set up. It's also now difficult for the page developer or the designer because they have to know that anything else that's supposed to be updated when I click on the color picker has to be a child of the color picker. Well, that, that structures the page in a, quite an unusual way. So this is a very compelling reason to use ice faces is because 
Developing composite components is, is very simple, and using composite components is also very simple. And in fact, you can't even really m make use of a non-ice faces component in, in certain page designs. So this is very effective. Now, these are some other aspects of GSF2 that are not as ice faces specific as the composite component. One of the improvements in GSF2 is the standardization of the serving resources. What, what this means is that resources are served from the faces servlet. You don't need to add in your own resource servlet. Some things to keep in mind is that there, there's EL evaluation performed on CSS. So sometimes you have to watch out in your CSS syntax because it's going to expand EL expressions in there. You may have something in your CSS file that you didn't expect to be EL expanded. This is a benefit when you need one CSS file to refer to another one because you'll use e expression language to relativize that relationship between those, those CSS files. The reason is that for that is because you, you may have your application deployed under a variety of different mappings. So GSF has to figure out what mapping you're deployed under, and then the GSF resource serving will use that mapping throughout. Here's the sort of the dividing line between what GSF2 provides and what component libraries like IceFaces provides. All of the, the plumbing, effectively, of AJAX is provided by GSF, and then the actual components that do AJAX is provided by the component library or by you developing a composite component. There are reasons for using update regions. And the way you should approach it when you're using ice faces is that you should first develop your application. Just develop it, put the components on the page where you want. If you're happy with it, that's good. If you need to optimize, because ice faces by default will render the entire page for every interaction. Well, that's, that is the correct thing to do in order to guarantee that any changes in the page will be propagated, because you really don't know which components will be changed from one moment to the next. But if you profile your application and you find out that you need to squeeze a little bit of extra performance out of it, you can tell Ice Faces with FAJAX tag to only execute a portion of the page or only render a portion of it. So that if you restrict the execute, say to IDs four and five, then the re apply request values, process validations, update model, and invoke application will only be applied to those components that you identify in that AJAX tag. Or if you say, I just want to render four and five, then the rendering of the component tree will only apply to those components. So you can execute or render subtrees. On you would just do this for optimization, not for AJAX functionality. In GSF2, IceFaces makes use of, of a lot of these APIs. There are standardized JavaScript APIs that uh, are used. If you're using IceFaces, you, you typically won't work with these APIs yourself directly. These are, are APIs used by IceFaces. But they're, they're good to know. There are some cases where you might want to add a listener to the, the GSF events on the client sort of background information, that the instruction set for updating the page is an XML document that comes back with insert, update, and delete. Standard subtree execution and rendering that was illustrated in the, the other slide. The way that you de define that is through FAJAX. You don't have to use those with ice faces, but you can. One thing that you can do is disable the AJAX on a component. So if you go F AJAX disabled equals true, that will disable the AJAX capability on a nice faces page for that component. Let's say you had a command button that you really do want to do a full page refresh. You don't want to do an AJAX update. Well, you'll go AJAX disabled equals true on just that one component, and the nice faces will ignore it for, for AJAX handling. System events are in GSF2 as well. This is something that IceFaces internally makes extensive use of. What you're able to do in, in GSF now is detect when a component has been added to the page or to the, to the view as the view is being built on the server and then react to that in some way, either by augmenting the component. I'm not convinced that the application developers should use system events extensively, but they, they are they're, they're certainly very useful at the framework level. You can implement these lists.
softeners. View scope, we've talked about view scope. View scope is, is the scope that corresponds to the view scope denotation. In addition to the view scope denotation, there are a variety of other annotations that let you define the scopes. You can say that a bean should be session scoped. You can declare a component through an annotation. The managed bean, we saw that one. And then exceptions have been improved a lot from GSF 1.2 to GSF 2.0. If you've been working in GSF 1.2, you probably got a lot of mysterious faces exception. Some, it basically is saying something is wrong in your application, here's the faces exception. Well, in GSF2, the exceptions are now propagated out and stored. More of the life cycle is able to complete, and then the exceptions are available at the end. So you get a lot better idea of what went wrong in the application, and more valid output is able to be generated by your application when an exception does occur continuing through our grab bag of what's interesting in, in GSF2, bookmarkable URLs, flash scope lets you, you propagate things between requests, view parameters are sort of a step along the way of developing a more restful application. You can say that a, a managed bean is eager and then it will be created when the, the scope starts up, that's useful. There's integration with bean validation and new standards for, if you take uh, Seam and Spring Webflow, well, those have, as aspects of those have both evolved into context for dependency injection, web beans. So there is a, a standard mechanism of middleware for expanding the uh, various scopes that you have in GSF, because the managed bean facility in GSF is useful, but it's not anywhere near as powerful as something like JBoss Seam or Spring. So CDI gives you a standards-based, full-fledged dependency injection system. Now back to things like CDI, iSpaces 2 is also integrated with uh, frameworks that have uh, do have features that go beyond what, what CDI has, and th so there's still very good reasons for using them. Oops. IceFaces 2 is tested with Scene 3, or is working on tutorials, and then Spring Webflow 2.2 also is tested with IceFaces 2, and again, we're working on tutorials there. So what's next? I, um, it's not fair to put that Kermit on the slide anymore. Um, I'll explain that in a moment. I, but I, it's so cute, isn't it? How could we not have Kermit? So, HTML5, you've, you've actually seen some of the HTML5 demos with ice faces with the mobile devices because mobile devices have no legacy to them. They're modern browsers, very advanced browsers running on these devices. So we, we can use full HTML5 capabilities on them. What's, what's holding back the, the desktop is really Internet Explorer 6. And it's, it's necessary to allow people to continue to deploy their applications to IE6. So as eventually as IE6 becomes less important in various environments, then it will be phased out and we'll, I think we'll see a fairly rapid change then in component development because it will always take advantage of modern web features such as HTML5 where you'll be able to use SVG reliably on all the browsers that your users have. That, that will be a, a nice situation. You've seen Ajax push. Well, WebSocket is, is targeted at precisely the Ajax push feature. Maybe you're, maybe you're wondering why I have Kermit on there, and that's not quite fair because there, quite a while back where WebSocket started, the protocol did not take into account flow control and metadata and various things. In, in many ways, it resembled the Kermit. How many people have used the Kermit protocol? Okay, how many people are still using the Kermit protocol? No. Um, you remember Kermit. And it would, it would send data to the server, and then the server would have to send a response before they, they could uh, communicate again. It wasn't really a bi-directional protocol. It was very primitive. Well, WebSocket actually is improving, and it, it looks like it's converging on a standard. So it's being worked on with, uh, within the IETF now, and there's a lot of people with a lot of experience and protocols, and they're actively working on WebSocket. So at some point, we will have WebSocket available in browsers that will be widely deployed. But still, the, the problem there is 
Ajax push will have to tar target IE6. So it works well with the current HTTP mechanism. There's, there's not really a reason to change to using WebSocket if you need this fallback case for older browsers. Now, on the other hand, you may be able to make a more efficient implementation based on a high performance protocol that supports bidirectional communication. So that, um, that will be added to Ice Push when WebSocket is actually available in the real world. And in general, we're creating components, new components all the time. And as you've seen, now we have um, mobility features. And that's all the material I had for today. I'd like to take some questions. In your early slides, um, you showed some basic yeah, HTML. Uh, but to have the Ajax push work, to at least have to have like a value change listener on register for the components so that you know, if you're going to have a change to component A uh, result in something being pushed to change the appearance of component B, you have to have something listening on A, right? Um, yeah, if you want to do a push based on a value change, just in your bean, you have a value change listener, you can just call push render dot render. <coughs> In your value change listener. I'm not quite sure what you're getting at. Okay, I just didn't, I didn't see anything in the slide that showed you know that you have a value change listener for that you know, that source component. Well, there is there is no push component. You just call it from your bean, and typically you'll call the push APIs when something significant happens in the application, like. Your auction bid has been exceeded, so you need to push that out because another user has done something or a chat message has been submitted into the system. Okay, any other questions? The demo you did, I mean, the, you're talking about a scenario where multiple people are on a device and they're all looking at the same thing. The slideshow, but so that that presumes that they're on, they they're on an app designed specifically to, to view where everyone can be viewing the same thing, right? Yeah. If if you if you don't want them in your application to be all on the same thing, you can separate them into groups, and then you can you can push to do separate groups. Any other questions? Thanks for coming, everyone.